Thanks to everyone who's connecting right now for today's session. We're here for today's Aperture Healthcare webinar on physician recruiting secrets for healthcare hiring teams. My name is Elliot Stewart, and I'm a business development associate with Aperture Healthcare. AppleChat works with health, healthcare organizations in the USA and Canada to help them find and hire more nurses. Our speciality is sourcing passive nurse candidates from outside of job boards. So we are able to bring a bigger audience of nurses to our clients' vacancies. We also screen and engage with every applicant to make sure they're a good fit for our healthcare clients. To find out more about what we do and to access our free resources, please check out Patrick's online business card. We'll put a link to that in the chat. On the website, you can do the following. You can join our Nurse Recruitment Secrets Facebook group to share and learn more great ideas regarding nurse recruitment. You can subscribe to our monthly Nurse Recruitment Secrets newsletter. You can view all of our past webinars on nurse recruitment and sign up for our future free online events. You can also connect with Patrick to learn more about Aperture Healthcare's nurse sourcing services feel free to send him a message here in the chat or on LinkedIn as well. For today's webinar, we'll discuss the following topics. What makes physician rec recruiting different from our similar, or similar rather, to nurse recruiting? Kevin's secrets to success in physician recruiting? Implementable ideas around sourcing experienced and in-demand healthcare candidates? And how to get into phys physician recruiting? So on that note, I'd like to introduce today's speakers. Adam Chambers is the founder and president of Aperture Healthcare, and he's joined today by Kevin Kirkpatrick. He is the founder of Avery Professional Group. With over 23 years of experience in recruiting, Kevin has led three recruitment departments for hospitals. He's now running a search and consultancy firm. He provides advice and support to health systems that aren't happy with the status quo. Welcome, Kevin. Thank you. Now, to today's audience, we love it when our webinars are interactive, so please post your questions and comments in the chat during the session, and we'll try to get to them. Thanks again to everyone for joining us today, and I'll now turn it over to Adam to start the discussion. All right. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, and thanks, everybody, for coming. Um, yeah, today we wanted to do something a little bit different and put our looking glass on the world of physician recruitment, because... It's something that goes alongside nurse recruitment in the sense of hiring for difficult to fill positions that are so essential to the, the operation of a hospital. But often our audience here, mostly in nurse recruitment and HR, don't really know what's happening over there with their colleagues here recruiting physicians. Um, Kevin is focused on that uh, in his business currently, and I thought he would help us learn a little bit more about it and um, also uh, provide some insights to other recruiters and physicians as well. So yeah, this is going to be an interview format. If anybody has any questions, just post them in the chat yourselves. So the first question I want to ask you, Kevin, was what made you get into physician recruiting and when did you start it? Yeah, so I actually was lucky enough that in 2004, I left IT recruiting and tech recruiting and went to work directly for a hospital. Uh, the intent was to hire staff and nurses and then a crisis uh, in the physician uh, area resulted in me quickly learning how to, uh, how to recruit physicians. So um, it was more of a response to the uh, a mass exodus of physicians from the hospital that they needed to leverage the recruiting experience to try and proactively reach out to physicians. So uh, I was able to uh, to move into that as well as continuing to recruit nurses, techs and everything else as well. And uh, that's how it started. Okay. Um, we've had you on a few times talking about your experience in nursing recruitment, uh, healthcare recruitment and leadership. Could you tell us a little bit more about what you're doing now with your search firm? Yeah, so I am... Um, a, at you and I have known each other because I was uh, an early client of uh, of Applechats at uh, when I was with Humber River Hospital. Um, I've been always a, a big fan of uh, of what uh, what you've uh, what you've been doing. So we we've had our discussions about that in the past. 
I actually uh, off and on over the years have have worked for hospitals uh, as a consultant or I've worked as them permanently. Uh, my current scenario is I am focused on working with hospitals to develop uh, physician recruitment platform. So, and what I, some of our clients just want us to hire one physician. So they may come and say, you know, we need a neurologist, uh, help us find a neurologist. Some of our clients need locum support where they need coverage uh, for physicians or they need coverage while they recruit permanently. And then some of our clients have moved into more of a managed service practice where we do all of their physician recruiting for them uh, for a period of time. So, um, you know, it, it ranges on the client and it ranges on uh, what they want. But our, our primary focus is giving a client a, a, a robust recruitment process that allows them to attract as many position, as many physicians as possible at the most reasonable cost per hire as possible. Mm. Okay, thank you very much. If anybody's in physician recruitment, please uh, drop us a note in the chat and we'll, we can engage in some discussion. I first wanted to ask, what would be some of the main differences between physician recruitment and nursing recruitment? Um, I think it's just understanding healthcare in a bit of a broader sector because they're not physicians aren't necessarily confined to a unit and a, and a, and a, and a corporate structure. Um, they're independent consultants in a lot of cases. So, the relationship with the hospital is a bit different. Um, they might have outpatient clinics as well as their inpatient work. Um, mm -hmm. So there's some uh, some differences that way. Um, but there's probably more similarities than anything else, right? They're they're just as scarce as nurses. Um, you often have to create a, a social media um, approach to to attracting them as well. Uh, as the direct outreach approach. So um, they do seem to ask a lot more questions because uh, their work is dependent on a lot of different factors, dependent on equipment, dependent on patient flows and stuff like that. So it's not as it's not as easy to delineate what their role is. So there's a bit mm -hmm. more variable. So I think having a bit of a higher level conversation with them about uh, the role is, is the major difference. Mm -hmm. And I see we just got a question around that. Um, how do you convince local physicians that I guess you as a recruiter are useful? It sounds like you're saying you need to have more in-depth knowledge about their profession. Yeah, so it's um, it's really becoming, I mean, the approach I use is more of career planning um, and and helping identify the, uh, the ability to help the um, actually, oh, sorry, I'm going to take that from two different ways. One is from a candidate standpoint and, and having uh, having physicians work with you. I always promote mm -hmm. myself as a bit of a career coach and someone to help them navigate, kind of helping them find the best opportunity for them. From a, you know, a clinic perspective or a hospital perspective that might be looking for them, it really comes down to uh, educating them on what the market looks like educating them on the fact that it's not as easy as putting out an ad and somebody uh, is going, you know, you're going to get droves of applicants, right? So it's really having them understand the expertise and understand the, uh, the increased reach, right? Because not only do we put out social media ads to get people to reach out to us, we directly reach out, we directly have in, uh, referrals from other physicians. So it's, it's a broader net and a more in-depth net than just you know the ad them putting out an ad in for a pediatrician in the american pediatric association journal right mm. yeah so i hope that answered that question yeah no it sounds like it needs to be more all-encompassing and more of a multi-channel approach rather than just having a post on the show board so well and and a prime example, so I have a client of mine right now where they're recruiting for hospitalists, but part of the problem is the hospitalist structure they have is not conducive to recruiting anybody, right? Because the compensation isn't great, the, the scheduling is inconsistent and hard for somebody to imagine on an ongoing basis. So, uh, so we've had to bring in a consultant to help them look at their process and look at the structure of their department. And then as part of that, the recommendations, if if adopted, will then make it easier for my team to recruit, 
right? So it's really about being an expert in physician workforce planning and in physician uh, human resources, right? So it's not just about being a recruiter and saying we can find you people. It's about helping put them in a position where they can actively find people and are attractive for people to come. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the, the next question that followed up on that would be, do you have any, I, would, I, don't, want, I don't really like the word secret because we're asking you to share the secret, but strategies that work well in, in physician recruitment that are a little bit different than what people usually do? Um, so the biggest thing I find, to be honest with you, is understanding the job as in-depth as humanly possible, right? Because if, if, given the scarcity of the physicians, if you can't answer their first two or three questions about mm -hmm. the job, the likelihood of getting them engaged in your recruitment process is minimal, right? Because they, they just, you won't engage them because they won't envision the job and stuff like that. So, you know, any if a if a client of mine sends me a job description and says, you know, and then and then the salary and expects me to recruit based on that, it won't happen, right? I have an entire intake process uh, where I ask a large number of questions to understand the role. You know, what's the schedule? What uh, what's the patient population? Mm -hmm. uh, what's the com community? Uh, what's the team size? What's the call schedule? Uh, you know, where are the patients drawn from? What's the readmission rate? Like a lot of different aspects. So you can describe the job as much. And when I recruited nurses, I found you didn't need that as much. You needed to know, you know, the compensation, the number of beds in the unit, maybe the schedule and what the leadership was like. Right. So, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, it's a much more in-depth process. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, that makes sense. Going back, you said they, they want to, know more about the position and ask more in-depth questions so i think yeah, you want to have the answers to those questions definitely well and, they, and they're going to want to know about the hospital as well like it's not they're not as confined to a unit right they're going to want to know you know if they're a hospitalist they're going to want to know what the emergency department <clears throat> like is like you know who answers code blues what's the call schedule like are there nocturnists are there virtual you know what and when you're on call do you have to be in the building can you do it from home like there's just a, a whole host of questions that they need to you need to ask so that they can uh, get a full picture of what it is you're recruiting for and either engaged be engaged in the process to agree to mm -hmm. do a site visit to agree to meet with the client and stuff like that right so even your advertising has to be uh, and your social media posts have to be uh, you know uh, really strong in in demonstrating that information right yeah um we'll take some quick fire questions uh garav said like what areas should an up-and-coming physician recruiter focus on it sounds like to me attention to detail is massive is there any other like certain work traits that yeah so i you mean uh so i i can i can take that question a few ways but the um you know what I tell most people is is to try and find a uh, an area that that you're specific to, right? So, you know mm -hmm. maybe you recruit neurologists, right? Because it's a lot easier to become an expert in one discipline and one specialty than trying to be uh, for them all. I'm spoiled in the sense that when I worked for the hospitals, I recruited for all of the disciplines, so I'm a bit of a generalist that way. But in a large market, is often easier to pick a specialty and then be an expert in that specialty. Therefore, when you're recruiting, you're always recruiting for neurologists. When you're talking to clients, it's always about being in the, you know, an expert in the neurologists, right? Or in, in neurology departments. Mm -hmm. Okay, I hope that answers your question, Gaurav. Uh, one more quick fire question. Is affordable housing a barrier to recruiting? Maybe that's like, is it, is it difficult to get physicians to relocate? Yes. Yes. Yeah. And, and it's, it, it's, there's two ways to look at this, right? Depending on your geography, you can, will depend on, on what your strategy needs to be, right? So one of my clients is Peterborough, Ontario. And the beauty about Peterborough is it's an hour and 15 minutes from Toronto, right? So it's close enough that you can go to Toronto when you want, but the cost of living is drastically less, right? So if I can get a, a physician in Toronto interested in Peterborough, 
they're likely they're going to make the same amount of money because OHIP is uh, for in the pro, you know the provincial billing is the provincial billing, uh, mm-hmm. and if they're going to have the right number of patients and stuff like that, they then can look at moving there for uh, for cost of living, right? Whereas if you're trying to recruit someone into the GTA or into communities close to Toronto, where the cost of living is higher, then it's definitely an issue. Right. Because mm. that's why sometimes you see people move from Ontario to PEI. Right. Is because they they can get a, they can as long as the work lines up, um, they can uh, they can save money on on uh, on relocation. So, you know, the biggest things I find that affect physician recruitment outside of the job are going to be things like cost of living and spousal employment. Right. If I had a dollar for every time I had a physician want to come, but not to be able to because their husband or wife couldn't find a job in the region, then uh, I'd be retired on a beach. <laughs> yeah. Well, how do uh, how do hospitals get around that then? Do, do they have programs or uh, some some provide um, some will provide temporary housing. Uh, some will provide relocation assistance that might include that, mm-hmm. or it might be a, a situation of, you know, offering a, um, uh, you know, a bonus or, and then realistically, when it comes to the spousal employment, it's something you have to, you have to endeavor uh, and uh, research during the process, right? Because <laughs> you don't want to go six, six weeks into recruiting someone then only to find out that their spouse is some rare a uh, rare engineer that can only work in Toronto, right? So, I mean, you, yeah. uh, you do that. Or we do locums where someone does a regular locum, uh, you know, may live in Toronto, but does a, two weeks a month in Peterborough. Like, it's just, it's about trying to be as creative as possible. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, tailor it, I guess, because I know spouse for academics, for example, a lot of openings in, in that space are in smaller university towns. It's nigh on impossible for a lot of people with engineering careers or tech careers mm-hmm. to really get there unless they're working remotely. So yeah. definitely something that you can look to other industries to see how they're and some people, you know on. and and the lux the you know, sometimes you get lucky and the physician's income is high enough that the spouse can be a consultant. Mm-hmm. Right. So it's um you know it's it, it it's a different it's a little bit different world from that standpoint, but, uh, you know, it's, it, it's improving, but luckily in a lot of cases, healthcare people marry other healthcare people. So, you know, if you can find them a job at the same hospital, you're, you're laughing. Yeah. <laughs> All the way to the bank. Um, so I'd like to ask about some particular sourcing strategies. So with the view to what you say being tried and tested, in other specialties that aren't physicians. So we'd love to hear what are some of the sourcing techniques that you've used? Um, yeah. To get, get ideas about how we could use them as well. Okay. Yeah. So you mean a lot of, I, I, just like everything else, we, we use LinkedIn and, and tools like SourceWill uh, to message people off of LinkedIn and stuff like that. Uh, I spend a lot of time on Facebook ads um, that are crafted specifically and, and purposefully uh, as well. Um, I join Facebook groups and message physicians through Facebook groups. Um, I do a lot to try and find residents, uh, and build a relationship with residents, even though I won't necessarily place them right away. Uh, you know, building relationships with them so that when they are finished their residency, they look to you to help them find their, their first employment, um, offering locums, a lot too is, is, you know, offer locums and let people come try the community out, try the hospital out and, uh, um, and without having to commit, you know, hopefully those people then come and, uh, come and, um, uh, you know, enjoy the, enjoy the community, enjoy the work and want to stay, um, for, for the U S there are a lot of different lists and stuff and practice match and, uh, and uh, profiles LLC that you can buy lists of physicians um, mm-hmm. and reach out to them. So I mean, there's different tools that way. I mean, there's uh, there's other social media tools like Heartbeat.ai that's uh, that's gaining steam in the U.S. Um, you know, the reality is there's two aspects, right? There's the aspect of defining the job well, and then the aspect of getting the contact information, right? So any way you would historically find contact information for anybody else. You just have to apply that to physicians 
uh, and then really maximize the quality of your communication um, mm -hmm. because otherwise they won't get engaged. Yeah, I'm gonna type this for the chat so people know it. Um, Sourceville and Heartbeat.ai, if you don't know, are platforms where you can get somebody's email address or phone number and then assign them to a outreach sequence. So you're going to the candidate instead of putting an ad up and waiting for them to come to you. Well, and the other thing I'm finding now with physicians is it often takes multiple emails to get a response. And I think right now I'm averaging it taking about three to four emails before they respond. So using a tool like Source Whale, uh, you know, is becoming more and more necessary. Or even you can use MailChimp or any of these other ones. Um, but it's really focusing on uh, prolonged outreach to the physician, uh, but and then having each message provide a tidbit of value, right? I when I'm doing my messaging sequence, I pretend like I'm having a conversation with them, right? And each mm -hmm. message should purvey more information about the job, right? So the first one might talk about the basics of the job. The next email might talk about the uh, the lack of call or the the patient population or you know whatever it is that i that i can describe each something different each time so that if yeah. they've seen all my emails they should have seen the bulk of the job posting in their emails right so it's it's just a matter of marketing the job to them uh, repetitively mm -hmm. if anybody wants to follow up on that point look up on google soap opera sequences um it's a type of email marketing sequence where, as Kevin said, you're varying it each day. So you're not just asking them to apply with every email. But you're also telling a story that keeps them engaged, and gives them tidbits of information, and brings them along a journey rather than just doing what everyone else is doing, which is asking them to do something for you. So give that a search soup opera sequence. Yeah, the other yeah. thing the other thing to note too is it is a longer process, right? I've I've seen it take anywhere between three all the way to twelve months to close a, a physician vacancy. So mm -hmm. I mean, you have to take a take a look at the long game um, and be constantly focusing on uh, you know uh, outreach daily and um, and relationship building. Yeah. So don't give in after your first email is ignored. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, no. no, you've got, you've got it. I mean, I, I don't inundate, like I like to do it a week apart. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, because I don't like I, I early on, I was doing it like every two days and I had people telling me to take a leap. Um, but I found if I do between five and seven days between, I get a yeah. much greater response, right? Because they don't feel like they're inundated, but they, but you are being um, consistent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. So I'd like to talk a little bit, how can, say somebody listening does nurse recruitment at the moment, but they kind of like the sound of this physician gig. How do you, how do you get into it? Is it as simple as applying for a job and talking about your other recruitment experience or should they be doing things now? Um, so it, it comes down to just taking the time to understand the, the roles and understand, um, you know, the, the market, uh, and then explaining to whomever it is you're trying to get into uh, physician recruiting with, um, and, and display that you, that you understand the no, the nuances and the changes, right? Because any, everybody that's going to talk to you about making the transition is going to want to understand how, how you're going to alter your behavior, your work and alter your, your recruiting tactics for a different thing, right? But if you if you're coming from clinical recruitment or nursing recruitment, I don't see why you can't move to physician recruitment because, you know, the, recruiting is is I mean, I've always been a firm believer that recruiting is recruiting, right? The relationship piece and how you build relationships is a differentiating factor, right? So, if you can communicate efficiently with the physician and understand the physician and understand the role and have the conversation with them where you can where you can t advise them on on what you know what's good about the role and and what they should look at um then i think you can make that transition right it's but again it's like focusing on less conversations uh, mm -hmm. but an increased quality of the conversation 
I love when you talk about that stuff. It really motivates me to refocus on what's important. Well, it's really the relationships. Yeah, you don't, we, you mean, it's not a transactional thing, right? Because very, very inf infrequently are you relocating somebody within the same city, right? So you have to understand is that most physicians are potentially moving, uh, changing communities and stuff like that. So it's not a decision that they're going to, they're going to make lightly. So you have to be reassuring in your process and reassuring in your communication with them that they're making the right move, right? And, you know, I've gone as far as arranging bus travel for, for a physician's kids uh, so they could go to get to the school they wanted to get to, right? Because again, it's about, it's also about onboarding them into the community so that it's a successful placement as well. Mm. Yeah, it definitely, it definitely goes deep. And um, it's great that you consider the family thing as well and the spouse treating them as a person, not just a, a candidate. Well, you know, a nurse can a nurse can change hospitals in the same city, so it's not the same. It's not the same, right? Now, if they're relocating, then obviously you you've got to build that relationship as well for them too, right? But I do definitely think that um, you know, if if you can manage the the interpersonal and the relationship side of it, then you can easily make the transition from from a mm -hmm you know, clinical or, or um, you know, other area uh, into the physician recruiting, right? Yeah, I think people in nurse recruitment, including me as well, probably don't really think about the various factors that make relocating nurses trickier than other professions. Mm -hmm. It sounds like, it sounds like, yeah, you said with physicians, there's not as many options where they are and they're more mobile and their families will come with them. But I get the impression nurses we do have to work harder and they can travel nurse if they want to move about. Yeah. Uh, well, and, physicians, and physicians can do locum tenens and travel about too. So you I mean there's a lot of similarities as well too, right? Like, you know, we I find right now that a lot of my clients are looking for locums. Right. Because mm -hmm. the younger physician doesn't necessarily want to settle down somewhere right away. They want to try different places out. Um, so they locum. Right. And, in, in yeah. you know, specifically in Canada right now, people don't seem to want to, uh, you know, join a practice and roster, you know, 900 to 1200 patients right away. They want to locum and try communities out. Right. So that's the other thing to, uh, you know, for my for my clients. You have to be willing to uh, to accommodate locums so that people come see how great the place is and then hopefully stay and, and grow roots, right? Mm -hmm. Do you see any major trends emerging in physician recruitment that people need to get ahead of in the next 10 years? Uh, supply and demand is always going to be a problem, right? So until we start focusing on ensuring that we are training enough physicians uh, and, you know, you're looking at a seven year, six to seven year cycle, right? Because, you know, if I decide today that we're going to increase residency spots, um, you know, you've got four years of medical school and in, in the Canada, it's two years for family. In the U.S., it's three year residency for family medicine. So, you know, in the U.S., if I decide I'm going to increase the number of family medicine spots, yeah. I'm not I'm not going to I'm not going to get the results for seven years. So if we mm -hmm. wait for the last minute to determine what our manpower, our physician manpower needs are going to be, we're, we've already lost. So we'll automatically be working in a deficit for, you know, four, five, six years, right? So, I mean, that's part of the problem. Uh, it's even more, uh, even more uh, extreme in Canada because we we have less medical schools uh and we're create we're we're training less re less physicians right so the problem is is that nobody's decided to say okay how many hours of patient care do we need for the country and thereby how many how many physicians do we need to deliver those numbers of hours of care and how do we train those right so nobody's looking at the yeah. bigger picture and i think that's what's going to continually put us in a position where supply and demand aren't uh, aren't meeting each other right mm -hmm. Yeah, it sounds like you need to have vision and to be looking years ahead, not just doing yeah. the doing part now. Yeah. Well, and it's constantly changing too, right? Because everything we do is based on the demographics of the physician. 
So, you know, when I start, when I uh, went back to focusing on this uh, last year, um, you know, we, we, we assumed we were going to do mostly permanent placements, right? Because that's what our clients wanted. Um, and that's what, um, you know, what we thought. And now what we're doing is we're finding, we're doing as many locums as, as we are perm placements, right? If not actually probably more. So we've had to alter our business into more of a temporary staffing type of model with the locum physicians. And we've also, I used to be, um, you know, almost entirely cold calling for physicians. And now we're having to rely on social media even more uh, as well. So it's, it's understanding how they communicate, where they communicate, and then uh, adapting your message uh, and distributing your message where they are, right? Yeah. We've been doing TikTok ads for nursing and we realized that the best performers are ads that were not job ads. Mm. So the best performer was a bunch of people dancing in a field and we just had the captions talking about the job. When we tested that against ads that were saying very clearly, like, here's a point about the job, here's a point about the job, here's a point about the job, really candidate centric and attractive. But I think on social media, especially if people see it and think, oh, this is an ad, like they do on TikTok, like just go to the next ad. Well, and it's, um, it's, it's interesting. It's interesting too, because each platform is different, right? Like there are a lot of physicians on Twitter, right? But I was running Twitter ads, no uptake, right? Took that money and moved it to Facebook and targeted Facebook groups. And then uh, in two weeks with one client, in two weeks, I have five physicians interviewing, mm -hmm. right? From one Facebook campaign. Yeah. Right. So That's good. Uh, they Facebook ads, yeah. 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 A, a large portion of my budget from my clients goes right to right to Facebook ads. Yeah. Right. I stole from this nice. guy. Still works. There's this guy at Apple Chat that I met that he likes to do Facebook <laughs> ads and, and is really successful at it. So I started stealing his his mojo. Mm. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if you've met him or not, but gonna need that commission. Yeah. <laughs> the checks in the mail. No, yeah, we owe you. Thank you, Tom. Um, so if anybody has any more questions, please put them in the chat for Kevin. Um, is there anything, Kevin, that you I haven't asked you that you want to talk about? Not that I can think of off the off the top of my head. Um, you know, it's I the physicians are super interesting people. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I enjoy having conversations with them. Uh, it can be political as well, so you have to be mindful of that. Um, but it is a fun, it is a fun, uh, a fun group of people to recruit, right? So as long as you're willing to look at things in longer term and not expect to make a placement in, in six weeks, uh, yeah. you know, so you know, save your money, don't uh, don't spend it all, and uh, you know, and and uh, and maybe focus on a specific discipline. Um, you know, I mean, you'll, you'll, uh, and the trends will, the trends will, um, will show you too, right? Like in Canada, I'm doing a lot of hospitalist work and a lot of family practice. Um, you know, in the U S we're doing a, a lot of primary care. So it's, you know, the, the market will take you where, where you need to go a little bit too, right? Yeah. Definitely need to adapt to the market. I've got a couple more questions for we sure. go. The first one is, um have you successfully worked with romp that is the rural ontario medical, medical program. program i'll share my screen while you speak so people who aren't in ontario understand that yeah so um i have found romp to be uh to be uh good for for getting learners and locums um i do think that uh trying to develop relationships with the schools directly is also a benefit um, but I definitely have had some some uh, some positive uh, thing with, uh, with romp. I think the key with romp is having good preceptors, though. Like if if you can find a couple really cool characters in your community that uh, 
that will really jive with the residents and med students, that's the key, right? Is uh, mm-hmm. one of the communities, Peterborough had had uh, one of the romp preceptors of the year several times, and he was such a character that people came to the community because he was like, he was just that cool of a guy, right? So mm-hmm. I think if you have good preceptors, then, uh, you know, it, romp can draw people to you for sure. Well, what does a preceptor do in romp? Basically, the preceptor is, is the teacher for the uh, for the for this the, the learner, right? So, and Michelle Hunter at Romp is amazing. Uh, I've always had great great conversations with her. Uh, she seems to be a very a very good professional. Okay, nice one. Uh, thanks for answering that. I uh, learned something new there. Um, and Bob finally asked, how much did you spend on the Facebook ad? Do you want to share that or keep that under wraps? Oh, that's <laughs> interesting. Um, What's your client? He's, he's gonna, he's, he wants to know how much you've. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Taken it um, depends on volumes of vacancies um, and depends on the number of vacancies. Right. So I have one client that's only recruiting family physicians and their Facebook ad spend is $3,000 a month. Mm-hmm. Right. So it's, uh, you know, that's that. And that's that generated 133 leads uh, in October. So, uh, you know, it was you I mean, it was a good it was a good dollar spend. I try an average per client between two and three thousand uh, dollars. If I can go higher, I will. If I can go higher, too, then I might add in some Twitter ads for branding and then I might add a LinkedIn ad. Uh, as well, right? But right now, the bang for the buck has been on the on the Facebook. But what it is too is it's finding Facebook groups and then yeah. targeting the people in the groups, right? So it's not just running general general Facebook ads; it's making sure that you've got optimized and targeted Facebook ads. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that if you get them right, definitely. And the part of that is spending enough. If you spend under a thousand, then it's going to be hard to compete against the other ads. So you definitely yeah. need to have a budget to do it. Yeah, um, we, we bake that into our client engagements, right? Like at the end of the day, you're paying partially for my time and my expertise, but you're paying predominantly for for the for the uh, social media spend, right? Yeah. So thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, thank you, Kevin. Um, Kevin, if people want to learn a little bit more about you or maybe even get your help recruiting physicians, where can they find you? Yeah, so uh, my website's under development, so please don't go there. Um, you can check me out on uh, as Kevin Kirkpatrick. I'm uh, one of the, you, you now know what I look like, so it's easy enough to find me on, uh, on LinkedIn. Um, mm-hmm. I'm pretty heavily on LinkedIn, so that's a different spot. My Twitter handle is uh, at K underscore Kirkpatrick if you want to if you want to connect through that um and then my email is just kevin at averyprofessionalgroup.com okay. in the chat if anybody wants to connect the chat kevin and um if you want to learn more a little a little bit more about what we're doing over at happily chat i'll put in another link where you can get access to our previous webinars and sign up to future webinars, check out our newsletter and just take advantage of the free stuff we're putting out there to help everybody get better at recruitment. So yeah, thanks very much for coming, Kevin. Yeah, my I'll pleasure. It's always, it's always fun to talk about this stuff and it's always good to see you, buddy. Yeah, you too. Talk to you soon. Take care. Bye.